afternoon. I hope you're not too weighed, by, weighed down by lunch. <laughs> We're going to take you on a trekking trail, so don't suffer from any stitches along the way, okay? We have with us here this afternoon my childhood friend, a very dear, dear man who's heading the Guide Association of Bhutan, Mr. Garab Doji. Along with him, another wonderful thorough gentleman who I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years and our families go back for generations, the CEO of Young Phil Travels, Mr. Karma Lode. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. I was hoping to bring a lot of humor to this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, I've enjoyed all the sessions of the day and I hope we will be able to talk about Bhutan and its representation uh, as far as trekking trails go for the person who'd like to find out more about what, in, what it all embodies. So Garab, you in your, uh, in your association with uh, GAB, what has your association been so far? What has your role been? As a chairman uh, of uh, Guide Association of Bhutan, uh, what we, you know, the, the Guide Association of Bhutan uh, promotes professionalism in tour guiding. Uh, we have actually now done around, uh, we have trained around, around over 800 actually guides who have actually already been certified, so we do the upscaling part of actually our guide, so Wonderful. that they become more professional in handling the tourists. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, it wouldn't be enough without going back and tracing the history of how Bhutan has become so well known for its beautiful trekking trails. And for that, Karma, could you kindly tell us the history of how trails were developed for tourism in Bhutan? Uh, thank you, and thank you Mountain Echoes for having an adventure segment this year. We are very grateful. It gives us an opportunity to also say something about adventure in Bhutan, and this time uh, related to trekking. I think uh, trekking in Bhutan has begun as early as 1974, and uh, I say that because tourism began in 74, and uh, those days it's all about trekking in Bhutan. You couldn't drive to places. We didn't have much roads. And uh, when you get out of the car, you can go drive to a certain destination. And after that, everything is about trekking. Be it if you want to go to central Bhutan or parts of western Bhutan. And still today, I would say we have to trek quite a bit to various destinations. That's right. Now, Bhutan uh, has... Tell me, tell, uh, if I may add on, on Karma, if you really look at the tracking uh, it's not new thing for Bhutanese. If you look at you know, the Guru Rinpoche tracked all the way from Nalanda to, uh, to Bhumdham. Yes. And then the Bhutanese, you know, we started actually, uh, if you look, and it goes uh, even beyond that. If you look at the Tibetan king, Samson Gambo, he's supposed to have built uh, eight temples out of 108 in Bhutan. And that means, you know, the Bhutanese also have actually, you know, tracked to Tibet as early as 7th century. And also a lot of the trekking trails that we have are the trails which were used as early as, you know, 8th, 9th centuries. That's right. When the first tourism trails were being developed, we used all the old routes, didn't we? The trade routes and everything. They were all well developed. Now, most of the trekking trails in Bhutan are all based in the national parks you find very few trekking trails overlapping outside of the national parks. Having said that, there have been so much, there's been so much development in Bhutan, which is a positive thing, but it has also encroached upon trekking trails. So through many of our modern trekking trails, you will find an odd feeder road somewhere along the way. Do you think that affects the authenticity of being in the wilderness, being isolated, what we are reputed for? Uh, a bit of both. It has also it has affected uh, trekking trails, whereby some of these feeder roads have, have gone into the villages, which crisscross with uh, trekking trails. And for a trekker, when they come into such pristine wilderness and environment, and when they are trekking, it's not very nice for a land cruiser or a tractor to zip by. 
But on the other hand, it has also really helped the Trek operators like us because uh, a lot of those feeder roads, uh, with, all this, uh, with all due respect to having been made, are not maintained. So it has just widened the trekking trails, which is really an advantage and a positive thing at the moment. And for us also, the trek operators, when we have to reach out uh, our rations, our luggages and baggages and all that, we can get closer to certain destinations. And a lot of people in this world today don't have much time. So the, some of the longer treks have shortened, which is a positive thing. Thank you. Now I have a little anecdote to share with you just to lighten the moment. I remember about two years ago, I had some guests come into Bhutan. They wanted to go trekking. So I sent them off on the first day and they took the trail up the mountain and everything. And I knew of a little feeder road that led all the way to the top. So they climbed up from the other side and I rushed up on my bike <laughs> and waited for them on the top. And I hid my bike in the bushes and I prepared tea for them. And I had them believe that I ran up all the way ahead of them. <laughs> so yes, it has its advantages. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> Now your guides, when, uh, when you're organizing your trekking trails, there have been so many directives for maintaining, for environmental, uh, what we say, conservation and responsibility. What are the sort of guidelines that you have to follow on each trekking trail? Uh, the basic guideline is, uh, first and foremost, the guide has to have a trekking license. You know, he or she should have undergone a tracking course, which means once they do that, then they are certified. Once they are certified, there is do's and don'ts, and you know, and then the criteria for you know, like your campfires, yeah, where ca you can uh, build them. Normally, actually, the campfires are not allowed, and only at certain locations like Jangbotang, that is the base uh, base camp for J Mount Jomalhari, you are allowed there. Otherwise, in most of the camps, you are not allowed, despite the fact that there is abundance of wood. And also, we have actually designated campsites, you know, which means you can camp only around the designated campsite. Uh, if you do Jomalhari, there are certain uh, places where you can uh, you can camp if you uh, if you have an elderly client or if they are not able to push farther than than the uh, A point, then they can camp. But if you do a snowman track, then the possibility of let's say if you are starting from A to B there's no A1, A2, A3, you will have to move from A1 to, from A to B. That also, you know, makes this uh, so-called snowman track the one of the toughest tracks in the world. Wonderful. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of trekking trails that, are, uh, that exist in Bhutan that we have to offer. We can range from anything on an overnight Bumdra trek, which is a beautiful site in northern Paro, or you can challenge yourself and take on, as Garab says, one of the most um, Tough. toughest and you really need a lot of endurance to complete the world famous snowman trek. Now that's about uh, 28 days 28 days and it, uh, there's a point where you can reach around the middle of Bhutan where it's a point of no return because once you cross that uh, area around uh, from Laya Imola uh, you, after the 15th day then you just gotta suck it up and keep going <laughs> But uh, having said that, now Karma, you've helped uh, really mold the tourism industry in Bhutan. You've handled every level of visitor. I'm sure you've yourself indulged in, in many, many treks. Do you have a favorite trail of your own? Uh, I do. Uh, I have two favorite treks. Um, one, of course, is the snowman trek, which I had the privilege of doing it uh, two times. And to make it odd number, I have to again try and do it one more time. Uh, that is a very special trek because it's a very long trek. And when you go as a guide on that trip, and people who come to do that trek are very committed. They are there with a the purpose. They often are there with, with uh, meditation in mind because when it is 28 days long, after some time, I think I heard it in the mountain session also, is after some time you run out of conversation. Uh, you cannot discuss many things on there. You have to walk every day for 
12, 13 to 15 kilometers every day, climb passes that's as high as 5,500 meters, and on that snowman trek, you have to cross at least five to six, uh, five, above 5,000 uh, meters uh, passes. Do you think you could give us uh, a visual of a typical day at about 5,000 meters, the kind of animals you might see, the flora, the fauna, so to speak? When you are on a snowman trek, a typical day would be, one of the favorites would be going into the 17th day. That's a very tough trek, uh, tough day, and you have to scale uh, a pass of about 5,300. You would want your clients, particularly if it's a bigger group, about 12 packs or so, you want them up as early as 6 o'clock. And in the mountains, you wake up early anyway because the lights come through your tent and you, you cannot sleep. And then, of course, you are served breakfast and then you give uh, your guests some time to soak in the area because sometimes you arrive quite late at night and you are not able to see the surroundings uh, during the night. And then the journey begins around 7.30 to 8 o'clock. Of course, we have many guides, a very good client to uh, staff guide ratio. And then you start climbing up and then, of course, by the time it's lunch, you get to the pass and that's the climax of that day. And when you are there, there are clients who are thoroughly tired that you have to handhold and lead them to the, to the summit. Take them on. Yes. And then there are clients who are very energetic, who, who are there with a purpose, saying, I have done it. I'm doing this. I have done it now. And they say, can we go a few meters higher? You know? And the pass is just there at 5,300. But then there is a trail, the animal trail, a blue sheep trail that would lead up a few meters higher, about four or five, uh, about a hundred meter higher or so. And we let the uh, guests do that. And that is the highlight usually of their trip, having firstly uh, gotten to the pass and then also having done an additional trip. And then of course, descending from there, it's a time to work on your knees. And a lot of our clientele, uh, the average age that people come to Bhutan on treks because of certain situations, are the average age is about 60, I must say. And of course, they are also very experienced and good middle-aged uh, clients that come for that. And then when we reach the camp, the, the best part of it is that our camp crew would have gone ahead, set up the tent, and then just like you, of course, they don't use a motorbike, but they, they, they zip down the road wherever shortcuts are possible, and then they wait at the camp with the nice tea, cookies, biscuits, and all that. And then from the pass and on that route on a good day, and we usually have very good days on snowman treks, be it in summer, be it in the fall, or in the, in the spring. Winter, of course, is not accessible. We can see a lot of uh, glaciers, a lot of lakes, and very pristine uh, environment there and also the blue sheep, nice birds and all those are visible on those tracks. So it is really special. Now, speaking of uh, international clientele, age groups, a large concern for many trekking uh, groups has always been all altitude sickness. Now that's a relevant factor because you are taking clients up to a you know, pretty high altitude where the air is very thin, altitude sickness can, can get anybody, even a local. So, Karab, tell me, is there any particular guideline or instruction that the guides have to follow when something like that occurs? Uh, <coughs> from the very beginning, we say that this is not a race or a rally, there's no prizes, you know, even the pest can succumb to you know, acute mountain sickness. So you take your own pace and also we instruct them that normally if you are, if you are tracking, we say that you, know, you climb at the most 100 meters or around 300 feet, feet per hour. But despite that, you know, we do have actually clients who uh, not listen and, and then once in a while they get sick. I had a, you know, at one time, you know, uh, we had a 17 climb, so we, we were just doing that uh, Jumal Hari loop. And you know she was quite fit, and then you know she was always, you know, for the last, the first two days of the trek, she was always ahead of all, all the climb. Uh, and then when we reached uh, uh, 
despite the fact I had been reminding her every evening over the dinner table that not to do that. I said, anybody can get sick. You may be fit. You may have done actually tries in other parts of the world where we have climbed up to 6,000 meters. But you know, since we are actually gaining, you know, quite rapidly the height and altitude that she made, and then and then she got it actually. You know, and when we arrived at the base camp, you know. Uh, uh, she was throwing, you know, she was, she didn't actually, in fact, initially she didn't uh, eat uh, lunch, then, you know, she didn't drink tea, then, you know, and then and, and, uh, the staff were saying that she was throwing, so I went, and I saw that, and it's, we had two nights there, normally, uh, any track that you go by the Jumal Hari, uh, uh, the base of Jumal Hari, we had two, two nights there, mainly to acclimatize, and also to enjoy the beauty of Jumal Hari and Jijuda. And, and even on the second day, you know, uh, she was not well. So I, I, I had no choice but to actually send her back with, with, the, with the staff. You know, she went actually all the way crying. See, now having said that, it's such a vivid memory of even one client suffering. But if you look at the ratio of the amount of trekking trails our country has to offer and the thousands of trekkers that come and trek with us each year, I think the level of reaction and safety control is very much intact so that casualties are to a minimum. We'll have only two or three cases, I think, a year where people go through that discomfort. And touch wood, there's been no fatalities, there's been nothing untoward. But having said that, do you guys feel that we have so many trekking trails centered around Western and Central Bhutan. Do you think you could enlighten us more about older trails, current trails being developed in Eastern Bhutan? Uh, Bhutan, uh, all over, be it West, East, uh, or North, is full of trekking destinations. Uh, people center the treks around the Western region because our capital is here, all our head offices are based here. The airport is in Paro, and all the staff, trekking guides, the staff that we have, all live here. Sometimes it's about economy. And sometimes uh, if we have clients that are willing to have longer duration and willing to pay the price, I think towards the east as well as, as, well as central, there are a lot of trekking routes that are very enticing and which is recommended. But having said that, today our country owns two brand new choppers, helicopters, Airbus choppers, that is less sound compared to many other helicopters that we have used in the past. Now, something like they do heli skiing, we can do heli trekking here. In Bhutan, Bhutan, as you know, is a very small country. As the crow flies, it's just 90 by 200 miles. But within that, if you were to drive, it's four or five days, all the way from Paro to the corner of the east. But with this helicopter in mind, we can have now certain packages which could take us within 45 minutes to a remote part of eastern Bhutan where there are communities that's untouched by, by tourists, that's untouched by modernization, and that has absolute silence and breathtaking views and trekking uh, possibilities, both in the east as well as central. And with that, I think it's a whole new opportunity that a lot of, I think, the tour operators are working on at the moment to provide that. So the opportunities are limitless now. Now, most of you uh, will be able to find more information online if you log on to our Tourism Council of Bhutan's website. And you'll discover that there's so many different kinds of treks and trails on offer. You can go for the Bumthang Owl Trek. You can, as I was saying, you can go to Bumdra for a shorter trek. You can take the Druk Path, which is a beautiful four-night. You can make it one night if you really want to, but it's generally based over four nights where you trek between Thimpu and Paro. It's called the Druk Path. It's probably one of our most trekked routes. But there have been more developments in the past few years over, over this trail. So people are now looking at the other alternate ones like the Soyaksa and the Dagapella Thousand, Dagala Thousand Lakes Trek. And these are all, and I can assure you, uh, for not just trekking reasons, I've been on you know, various other reasons as well uh, to these remote regions. And the feeling that you get if you are trekkers, you will, you will, uh, 
you will know what I mean when you're standing in the middle of nowhere and as karma says you're fed up of talking to everybody else and you've also become fed up of talking to yourself <laughs> and you start getting bored with your own company you reach a new level of spirituality and if you go with the flow there's something positive that will change you and I've seen it on people who go on trails and come back to Thimpu before they leave to go back to wherever or whichever country they have come from and it's like a glaze over one's eyes it's beautiful to see because there's a certain calmness there's a certain acceptance that they have been through so yes it may take a few days to adjust back to your life you know wherever you uh, wherever you go back to but rest assured you become positively changed and I think that's the beautiful thing about trekking in Bhutan now, Garab, as far as uh, uh, the guides, you know, in Bhutan are concerned, where does this training happen? Do you, does it all happen on site? Do they have to go abroad? What do they do? Uh, some of the guides have gone out. Some have done in India. Some of them have done in Nepal. And w one or two who are fortunate to have actually a scholarship or some of the clients have actually sponsored uh, their actually uh, training in even in states. But most of the guides... Uh, who, who wants to do, who wants to upscale themselves, would, uh, we would do it here in Bhutan only. I think uh, this is more one of the most aspect, uh, important aspects of trekking. You have a guide. This is a guy you don't know from Adam. It could be a, you have how many women guides? Uh, we have around uh, 100 plus women guides. Excellent, excellent. As Her Majesty was saying earlier, everybody is getting this great opportunity in all walks of life. So now, when you come into, uh, for a trekking trail, you're meeting up with somebody you don't really know. How do you entrust your life? How do you entrust everything to this one person who tells you, yes, we'll be going from here to there and we've got to make it in five hours and don't worry. You know, so there's a certain trust factor that builds up. So hats off to the training and the, you know, the, the guidelines that the guides have to follow, the quality that they're representing in tourism. I hope that they continue to keep up that standard. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Now, as far as trekking trails are concerned, do you think in the future, Karma, we'll be able to mix a little bit more extreme adventure, extreme sports along trekking trails in Bhutan? Uh, there is every possibility. Uh, the sky is the limit. There are so many. We just need to open up and get some exposure. I think us tour operators in Bhutan, quite frankly, there are many of them here, we are quite lazy. We, we, we just do what is around that was there for so long. But I think we do need some exposure outside, we do need some advice, and we do need to go and seek out what is there actually that we can start new in Bhutan. A uh, lot of opportunities, I must say. Uh, there was this uh, National Geographic uh, television program on some two, two people who came to with the unicycle yes. trekking all the way from Bumtang out to the wilderness in the east is unbelievable of how they just scale those passes on that unicycle and go, go about such things there are people who will come for those and there is also an opportunity I, I, it's definitely done in places like Mongolia and all that Bhutan, there are a lot of areas where we can do horse trekking. Now, this will definitely in, increase the diversity of people who come and trek here because we have areas like places like in Gantigamba and so many other nice glacial vale, valleys like in Bumtang, you know, which we, where we can do horse trekking. And that will also increase that if we do that. And then there are other like bungee jumping, then... Uh, rope walking, all those things, uh, tree canopy, the, the ones that they have in Thailand and all that. And when we visited that, I think it's very doable here. And these are all that will be in sync with our tourism policy or has to be in sync with tourism policy of high value, low impact when we go into those. But opportunities are there. We just have to look and start. Now, trekking trails in Bhutan are not limited or rather extended to overnight walks wherever you may go. We also have marvelous day, day hike destinations, starting with Inthimpu, the very, very beautiful 
Tanguchery Monastery ha uh, day hikes that you can make. A good hour and a half vertical walk up. <laughs> or are the world famous Taksang Tiger's Nest Monastery that you may all know about. You can uh, get up to the cafeteria level in about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, from there it's another 45 minutes or so if you walk bristling up to the monastery. Now, through the years, Bhutan having become more popular as a destination with outsiders, these day hike trails have somewhat become congested. What do you think would be some sort of a, a, a cure to make it seem less congested? Um, <clears throat> it's definitely true that some of these treks, especially the Tiger's Nest hike, is becoming really congested during the tourist season. I think therein we need to have some discussion with the Guide Association, uh, APTO, Tour Operators Association, with the Tourism Council of Bhutan and of course the local leaders in Paro, whereby we need to put some uh, system in place. And that can actually quite easily be done if we can come on a common platform. But having said that, I think uh, we should not wait for such an opportunity. Us tour operators and guides that are actually out in the field organizing such things have uh, these things in our own hands. For example, uh, the memorial Chotan here, the stupa that's right next to the hospital here, that's also very crowded. I tell my guides, please avoid that. Take them to other stupas where nobody comes. So there are places, it's just like uh, I was just listening to the mountaineering with uh, Dame and all that. There are popular mountains, there are popular sites. Similar to that, there are many good destinations. Hardly anybody goes. But us tour operators and guides, we should not be lazy. We should think out of the box and take that one step forward to be able to increase the guest experience and make it very experiential for them and track, take to that other destination. It's very important. Well, if I may add on karma, yes. uh, <coughs> I, ha actually, I have been leading a Nat Geo adventure group for the last five years. And this, this trip, it goes all the way till Bumtang. And we do a 12 days, uh, uh, 12 days, it's a 12 day trip. And every day we do anywhere from two hours to seven hours high. And around four of the hikes that we do, are almost exclusive to Nagio. You know, I mean, in some hikes, I have never met you know, even locals. And uh, I don't know why actually, you know, uh, uh, the, the operators are not promoting either they don't know uh, or, or else even the way they design itinerary. For example, you know, we stay mostly two to three nights in some places. That also gives us an age or advantage to do those hikes. So that may, I think, you know, we especially the operators may have to redesign their itinerary, work together. But again, if they do that, again, you know, those are also get, going to get flooded. Well, there you have it. This is a really important time in Bhutanese tourism because we have a huge mix of what we can offer in any sort of standard. And this is the time where we can discover what is yet undiscovered and is just waiting to be discovered. So now, may I open the floor for questions if anybody has for karma or karma. Please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm one of the travel agents. So I have a question for the chairman of the Guide Association of Bhutan and uh, one of the board members of GCB. Uh, I think there are three points that I want to, I would like to raise here. The first one is that, uh, like you discussed with uh, right now about uh, the two choppers that are in the country recently. So as a tour operator myself, I did uh, like as a track a couple of times. So next destination is like you said, it's not many, it's one of the toughest. And uh, I have come across with few experience, like there are sometimes a very senior clients, the elderly clients who would get sick on the way, perhaps in the middle of a path or somewhere in the beginning before acclimatization or even after acclimatization. So, uh, is there not a need for us that uh, to look up, look at? Because you never know if there's a very elderly client up on the way in the hill, and then there's no way that we can do anything like the 
medical attention or even any service. But then, why not we have a SOS service and evacuate them if he's seriously sick? Because there's no way, he, like uh, Kelly said, we reach to a point where there's no point of treatment. That's the first thing. And the second is the point is, which is also very important. I think uh, your question, well fielded to Garab or Karma, if you would like to take it. Okay, uh, thank you. Y yes, uh, you are right. Uh, there is actually SOS service. We, they may not call it SOS, but em emergency responding services to clients getting sick and strangled up in the mountains. Tourism Council of Bhutan has a hotline, a number, and a person dedicated to respond to such things. But to let you know, all the clients, guests that sign up for difficult treks in Bhutan, there are questionnaires, there are waivers that they have to sign, there are insurance that they have to bring. Sometimes all those are covered in that lab. Ma'am, we'll get you. I know that it's not fair to compare it to Nepal because it's an old trekking country. And uh, that's what I'm familiar with. I've been going there. And uh, I'm asking now about accommodation overnight, you say 12 days. Because in Nepal, every few hours there's villages, and then they give you rooms, and uh, they give you showers, and they give you food. So it's informal. Uh, whereas I'm not sure what your trekking companies do for accommodation. That, 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 that is the beauty of trek in Bhutan. We don't have that. Otherwise, you know, the whole idea of trekking is lost. Yeah, you come we, back we and yeah. you come back smelling like a yak. <laughs> and 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 because of that reason only. That's why I you know, narrated in the beginning that if you go from A to B, there's no you know, A1, A2, A3. You have to go from A to B. Yeah. Karma will uh, elucidate on that. Just to uh, with Q from Garup, uh, there are different trekking packages that are offered in these mountains. Uh, some packages do offer shower, hot showers, every second day, and if necessary, even every day. The difference between trek in Nepal, I've done some treks in Nepal, and here is, if you are going on a, this is a very good statistics to imagine that, if you're going on a 28-day snowman trek, and you have 12 people, guests on your trip, we start from Paro with about 96 horses. That is very different from Nepal, because in Nepal, every few days you have guest house lodges and all that. Here we have to take all the ration, food supplies, everything from the beginning till the end. Now, just to build on that a little bit, trekking, trekking equipment and provisions through our uh, tour companies can range from a simple t uh, tent to beds in your tent with a carpet on the side and a night light and you know the charm of uh, semi glamping as we may call it which we'll come to in just a little bit sir you you sir yeah, uh, colonel sir please I just, sir. Uh, any things that you're doing for the young trekkers you know for the children or for the young trekkers you have, otherwise Bhutan seems to be a destination which is only for elderly people it's all of culture culture but uh, young tourists coming into Bhutan who like to go to Disneyland and things like that, how do you motivate them? And, and trekking is a wonderful way you know, to get to the nature and things like that. So any, anything that you're doing? I remember somebody saying that, oh, all the uh, people who come to trek in Bhutan are so old, it must be their bad karma that they're forced to walk up these mountains. But no, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it is uh, expensive compared to you know regular tourism in any other country. But karma... I'm sure you know about the programs that we have and the ways we can make it exciting for the youth of other countries to come to Bhutan and trek. If you're looking for an experience of a Disney world, Bhutan is not the place, definitely. That has to be from the beginning, I have to say that. But having said that, there are a lot of young uh, youth, children from all over the world, school children, school trips that come and trek here. And we do cater to that and the cultural immersion that they get with the community-based tourism that we have, they don't necessarily have to hike up to very big mountains or passes and all that, but there are community treks that, uh, that we do, and the cultural immersion that they get from there 
they go back with their lives changed. They don't want to see Disney anymore. My dear Piyush, please. Uh, I don't really have a question. I have a comment. Being a practitioner of brands, and this is an answer to the gentleman who asked the last question, that a brand cannot be everything to everybody. And I think uh, the thought of having Disneyland's and all is completely counterproductive to my mind. We, we can't be everything to everybody. And uh, that comes to the question of what we've been discussing over the last three days is what should be Bhutan's identity? What should be the brand Bhutan? And I think that's a very critical stage that you're going through. It's almost the same thing as uh, how much of traditional advertising should we do and how much should we think about digital? When um, a billion people in India are watching movies, should I worry too much about digital? But I have to learn it too. Wonderful. This contributes to the whole idea of our policy being uh, high value, low impact. Ma'am, right there. We'll get to you. Okay, thank you. Come to you. Thank you for being here. Um, my question, you may not be able to answer because it may in fact be a um, immigration or a political issue, but as a local here who has a work permit or a um, dependent permit, when I apply to trek, either with a guide or not, it's denied. I'm told I have to leave the country, give, a, give away my visa, my work visa, and come back in on a tourist visa. Now, my question for you is, is that fair? And is there anything, any impact that you have or could have on allowing those of us who live here who contribute to Bhutan to actually also trek? Yes, uh, we will be able to answer. Garab and I are tour guides, and we are supposed to have all answers. <laughs> if we don't have, we make up. So, to answer your question, this is a question that has been asked over and over again. Uh, this is not to blame you expats that live in Bhutan. This is to blame us, the tour operators, or ourselves, the Bhutanese people that are here. Oftentimes, in the past, what happened is, when we have uh, expats here, we Bhutanese people get become friends with the expats here, and we try to bring the genuine tourists in the name of the expat's guest. And as I expect those days, you're allowed to invite family members, you're allowed to invite friends and all that. This went out of hand till the government said we have to curb this. But they're looking into it again. A lot of those, these problems, uh, we own hotels and we have expats working in our hotels that are also not allowed to go beyond certain point. And this, this issue is put up to the government and we are quite definite that some positive answer will come out from there. So there is hope. You, ma'am, please. Um, you mentioned about Taksang and Tango and uh, Cherry. I'm just wondering if you've got any other suggestions of great places to go as a one-day uh, hike. As this lady, I live here in Bhutan, so I'm always looking for a hot tip. Where do you live in Bhutan? In Paro Drugel. Well, there is this one beautiful trail which I really love making. It was up uh, past Shari to a place called Chukula. And that is a gradual walk until the last 40 minutes or so. I think you like that as a day trail. It's very, very nice. Try that out. Uh, you can also do, uh, you can drive to the, the highest motorable pass. That's Chalana Pass. That's around 4,000 meters. From there, you can go to Kilagamba and then, then you can hike down the down to the road is going to take anywhere uh, from uh, two to four hours. You can do that. Or else from there you can actually, if you are fit enough or if you uh, get up early there, you can actually hike from there uh, to Paro. We'll feel one more question if you don't mind. Sure, please. Uh, short question, then one more. <laughs> Yeah, the, the sure. visa, the visa, uh, tourist visa problem and the day hikes, how do those uh, two meet? 
If you have a visa to be staying in that particular district, the hikes around there are absolutely no problem. Um, we have someone at the back who's been waiting. Sorry. Please go ahead. Right. Thank you guys so much for your, your thoughts. Uh, as an American who's been living here for the last two years, I'm really curious uh, what you can do to kind of promote uh, a lot more local tourism within the country. I've noticed a lot of Bhutanese folks take pilgrimages outside of Bhutan uh, to, to other places uh, such as Bodh Gaya and whatnot. Uh, but there are a lot of great places like Singhezong, uh, Belangdra, etc. Uh, and how you can kind of uh, offer more experiences that don't just cater to tourists, but offer experiences for Bhutanese to see the beauty of their country. Well, before I hand it over to Karma and Garab, I can assure you that in Bhutan, our culture is walking. Our, you know, we'll be up the mountain, down the mountain before you can, you know, finish cooking dinner but uh, and and a lot of our village folk if you go and take their blood pressures they all have a hundred and seventy by hundred and twenty and you know doctors who, who I work with sometimes on our uh, on our medical camps that we go on charity sometimes with they turn to me and go you know she should be dead <laughs> but they don't know it you know, my head hurts, my knee hurts, and the diet is heavy, a lot of red meat, red rice, heavy salt, but because they're constantly walking and exercising, somehow they just keep going. And through the ages, it's filtered down to our youth. And there are now so many more locals who are doing this. Yes, to answer your question, local tourism is on the rise, actually. And we may not term it as tourism, the local tourism, but there are a lot of pilgrimages happening within the country as the economy is doing better. As the villagers have their sons and daughters in the capital who, who are earning well, they, they have the earning power, they are sponsoring their parents and the villagers, the friends that are in that district to go places like Tatsang, Chumpu, and in the east, Singizong and all that. It's on the rise. Now. now, I'm sorry, but I have to cut this session short, but Garab and Karma and myself are here. Thank you so much for attending. We'll speak with you if you have more questions for us outside of this arena. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Garab. Thank you, Karma.